In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, the theme that runs through it is repentance. In Paul, it's very direct. In the story of the healing of the centurion's servant, it's a bit indirect, but it's still in operation. Repentance, we hear that word. And it conjures up sometimes all kinds of images. Repentance sometimes comes across as we have to be right with God. We have to be on God's right side, on his good side. We have to appease God. Therefore, we have to be filled with guilt to the point sometimes of beating ourselves up as a virtue. Now we know that that is not the orthodox way of repentance. Repentance, as we in our tradition teaches us, is that repentance is really coming back to our senses to realize that we are feeling a bit of estrangement from God. Not that God ceases to love us, nor that God ceases to be with us, and loving us into life. No, it means that somehow or other I have separated myself from God. I have literally enclosed myself into myself and now I am suffocating from this experience. And I feel this lack of life in my life as if I'm only going through the motions but there's nothing out there. But we come to our senses, like the prodigal son, and we go back to the father with humility. Humility, that's another misused word many times, misinterpreted. Humility is basically knowing the truth about ourselves. And so when we exercise humility, we look into ourselves in a spirit of trusting in God's love for me. I have strayed. But the Lord wants me back. He wants me to live life again. He wants to take me out of the cave of death sometimes and to resurrect me into newness of life. He's inviting me into newness of life. And in that, union takes place. And that is why repentance is really a joyful exercise in our life. It's, it's a realization that I am so loved and why am I walking away from this love by certain actions in which I become my own God? But then what is sin really? What is really the basis of sin that causes us to repent? Sin, the basis of sin, I believe, is fear. I think every sin that's committed, the basis of it is from fear. And there's an acronym about fear. It means false evidence appearing real. It's illusion. It's as if we're alone and God is way out there. That's where fear takes place. It's all up to me. I am alone. And that's the lie that the accuser puts in our brains. The old boy, the evil one. And we know that's false. But yet, our Lord, even then, is inviting us into his life. He knows what we're going through. He knows our struggles. He knows our pains. He knows when we get up in the morning and we go to bed at night, and he's with us all the way, within us, beside us, in front of us, behind us, on top of us, behind, below us, surrounding us with his love. And today, Humility and repentance is being directed in a kind of an indirect way, but very strongly at the same time in the story of the centurion and his sick servant. The servant most likely is a soldier under his command. Centurions were officers who had 100 men under their command. And it's very interesting that there's kind of two, not different versions of the, of the story, but one that adds to one. In Luke, 
basically, the centurion is kind of nervous about going to Jesus because he knows what, well, he's entering into his own humility now, knowing, knowing who he is, and he doesn't feel worthy to go directly to Christ, so he asks some of the Jewish elders to kind of be his front men, to go to Jesus and propose a solution that the centurion is agonizing over, and that is his servant or his soldier under him is sick unto death. We know in Matthew, we see that the result of the, uh, the Jewish elders' intervention, the centurion takes it upon himself to go to Jesus directly. He's still nervous about this, but he's not as nervous as he was because the elders have now assured him that he can now go to Jesus and talk to him about his problem. When the centurion goes to Jesus, he has in his mind who he is. And who he is, he's looking over his life and going, I have fallen short in so many different ways. I have done things I'm not proud of. But yet, I have someone who I care about under my command. And this man who I see is someone who I trust. And that is the basis of repentance, is trust in God and his love. There's a trust there that I feel so trusting of this man. I don't know why, but I feel trusting of this man that I'm going to put myself under his authority. As we see, the centurion was talking about authority. Yeah. I have people under me. When I say go, they go. When I say come, they come. And I have authority over me. And I obey them. But I'm in front of someone who is the ultimate authority in all things. I sense it. I don't know where it's coming from, but I sense that this man is more than a man. And so he comes to Jesus in a spirit of humility, a spirit of trust, a spirit of surrender. I am now putting myself under your authority. Jesus is astounded by this man's faith. He says, I've never seen anything like this in Israel. This is raw faith. This is faith in action. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is where faith becomes life. And the faith was sprung from a spirit of humility. I can't, Lord, but you can. And in that, new life springs up and blossoms. And so when we look at this story and we look at Paul's letter to the Romans, we see nothing but joy from slavery, as Paul talks about, to freedom. That is what our Lord is offering us. And once again, repentance is not a self-help program. We are making an exercise of our own will to say, there's something much better than this that I'm experiencing, and the Lord is the answer. But we know also that it's the Lord whose grace and the power of his love works in our life to bring forth life. So we do our part, in a sense, of, like the centurion did, showing up, appearing before the Lord. And then with trusting, and the Lord knows what, he's, what he is all about. He knows what he's doing. He knows our hearts. He knows our struggles. So he's going to take us by the hand and lead us into life. And he does this every day of our life. And that is why even in our prayer, you know, it, it's an exercise in trust. <laughs> it's an exercise in, Lord, you know, you have called me by name. And this is all about relationship. And when I fall, you're going to pick me up again. As long as I take the effort to start getting off back to my feet, you're going to lift me up even higher. And then you're going to lead me to a place of life once again. And so the invitation today is trust. 
and to put aside all those false notions about repentance and all the false notions about humility and to see repentance as a, a total exercise of joy. I have been dead and now I'm alive again. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind always, now, and ever, and unto the ages of ages.